another goal off the bench for John Duran for his country, adding to the six goals he already has for Aston Villa this season. Five of those have come as a substitute. So how does Duran go from super sub to starter? I'm joined by The Athletic's Aston Villa writer, Jacob Tanswell, and senior data analyst, Mark Carey, as well. Jacob, let's get into this. That tag super sub for someone like John Duran, who's clearly got a bit of an ego. I don't know, man. Do you feel that's a bit of a, a backhanded compliment? I think it is. I think, especially in England, we've got this tendency to be obsessed with super subs and to have someone like him who's so exciting... Uh, it's it's great for the league, really. I think super subs well earned, and I think we'll come on to it. But he's only twenty, so and he's got Ollie Watkins standing in his way. So I think right now the super sub suits him perfectly. I mean, so weird, right? We did literally just before we were recording. I just saw you gleaming and smiling because <laughs> I think you've probably seen a lot of John Duran since you've been covering Villa. Talk to me about what it's like to see that young lad in the flesh. You know, from a football perspective as well as a journalist, of course. I think I bought some shares in him early on. To be fair, I was. <laughs> I was obsessed with him from the start. It's because he, the way he carries himself, just, you know, how he is, you know, in this, especially now, everything's quite beige in terms of, you know, talking mm. to, to footballers. But he's just got this character and it's fantastic to have someone like him. He's almost like a throwback in not only his playing style on the pitch, but how he is off it. Um, yeah, some of the goals he scored last season, this season, it's not what we expect from, you know, this very highly filtered modern day game. Yeah, nice one. Right. Uh, Mark, bring us back down to earth. Let's talk some numbers, right? Uh, let's look, look look at some of the stats uh, around this young man. And a lot of them are, are quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm going to be a bit of a party pooper here because <laughs> I think it's it's something we can come on to in terms of how sustainable his his current yeah. numbers are. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nine goals uh, in 772 minutes. That's uh, minutes per goal ratio of 85.8 minutes. So he's scoring better than one goal a game. As I say, I do think it's it's massively impressive. Of course it is since he arrived in the Premier League. We can go into the exact numbers, of course, but it does require a huge amount of, of context, of, of caveats. I, I mean, thinking about this season as well, he's doing fantastically well, do not get me wrong. And to Jacob's mm. point, aesthetically, he's amazing to watch and we can talk about that. From a numbers perspective, he's played 184 minutes across seven games, all of them <laughs> substitute appearances in the Premier League at least. I typically like to look at a player's profile after about 900 minutes at a yeah. very push 500 minutes. Um, and of course, he's, he's kind of nowhere near that for now. So I, I realize my job is to, you know, have my head screwed on and, and maybe calm things down a little bit, which I don't really want to do for this podcast because he is such a fantastic player. And of course, we'll come on to it. But, you know, th think about the, the Everton finish, amazing mm. finish from outside the box. He won't score those goals very often. That's why mm. they are so special. So I think it's it's worth noting and celebrating how amazing he's been and the impact he's had off the bench. Um, will he continue to score from distance like that? Probably not, but in the short term, we can uh, celebrate it. I think it's interesting to see things like his 40% conversion rate uh, so far and the, the, the few shots that he's had. For context, the average striker had a shot conversion of about 14% since the start mm. of last season. So expect that shot conversion from him to come down a little bit. When we look at someone like Erling Haaland, he sits at 24% since the start of last season. So, you know, the superhuman Erling Haaland even can't reach those, those levels. So, as I say, my job is to contextualise those numbers, exercise a little bit of caution. But that's only from a numbers perspective. You know, looking at his performance in general, um, yeah, mm -hmm. very happy to to lord him for all of that. Okay, we got we got to go deep a, a little later on, gents. Don't worry, we'll we'll bring everyone back down to earth. But um, Jacob, from your perspective, though, I mean, those numbers are impressive. With the caveat that who knows how long he can sustain it for. Yeah. But why do you think he's made such a good start um, this season, in particular, especially off the bench? I think for him, it's just about being in that settled environment, really. He, we will come on to his personality and his character, but I mm. think the summer was a real, real big, you know maybe a slide indoors moment in his career maybe in retrospect because he needed to feel loved I think Unai Emery outlined at the start of the season when everything was going on with the Chelsea with the West Ham links that he would start to play more so last year he would come on in games where Villa would need a goal maybe 75th 80th minute where Unai Emery made it clear to him at the start of the season he would come on 60th minute for Ollie Watkins so he'd have a good you know, chunk of time really to come on impact game and that's regardless of the game state whether Villa were leading or trailing and I think that bit more of importance really is does really well for a, a player like John Duran because he wants you know he wants that type of responsibility and when you see him you know 
when Unai Emery calls him from his warm up, which isn't you know not always the most animated, uh, active warm up. There is that sense of theatre really because Villa Park gets up and you just expect you know him to do something when he comes to the pitch. You know Villa Park have nicknamed him King of Chaos, Captain of Chaos, and I think he really quite relishes that. Yeah, do you think this output and be real now um, <laughs> it, it is sustainable? Because look, you know, I, I'll come to you from a tactical perspective, Mark, in a second, but you know. Defenders will wise up to this. There's, there's only so many times you can come off, come off the bench. Every now, what everyone knows what's going to happen, right? Let's tighten up. Let's man mark Duran. Let's pull him out wide so he doesn't get the opportunity to hit those absolute ballers from outside the box. Well, well potentially, but with Don Duran, if you speak to anyone at Villa who watches him in training, uh, he scores those type of goals, you know, like he did against Everton a lot because he has a lot of shots. You know, you can, he's not, you know, the most adept in link, you know, link play and getting between the lines. He's kind of an old fashioned, he'll get the ball. If he sees the goal, he will just shoot, you know, and. I'm not sure for defenders how you really market it because a lot of it is just individual brilliance. Of course, he's not going to maintain his rate. You know, that's you know would be outlandish to say. But I do think if he continues to be a sub, he will start make impacts in games more often than not. Yeah, Mark, you know, from a tactical perspective, is it indulgent of us to say, oh, this is part of Unai's master plan? You know, <laughs> Ollie Watkins is out there just wearing out players so John Duran can come on. For the last 10, 20 minutes, add his little je ne sais quoi and, you know, <laughs> just keeps working every time. I mean, I wouldn't get a bet against it, given Unai Emery's, mm. you know, skill set as a, as a manager and as a coach and a tactician. But, but yeah, I don't think so, is the short answer. I think it's it's not a, a habit that Villa want to get into to chase the game as well. And only, that's, that's only happened a few times mm. this season. But when they're in drawing game states or, or losing game states, they, they need a goal. So it's even more onus for, for John Durant to, to have an impact but yeah I'm, I'm sure we can come on to the the combination of Ollie Watkins and, and John Durant together potentially but I think you know it's worth discussing just how good it is to have a player like that within you know squad building having someone with a slightly different profile a slightly different mindset to be able to impact the game whether that's from the start which we can come on to or mm -hmm. you know from from the bench as well and to, to Jacob's point as well he's he's a fantastic player he's He's super strong. He's really tall, which I think gets him out of all manner of issues sometimes with just being able to to stretch his legs. His his movement is is really good. He arcs his runs really well, like an old fashioned number nine. And Jacob said about his first time finishing, that's really strong. Um, good in the air as well. We saw the goal against Leicester this season that he's he's shown he's he's good at uh, winning aerials. And I think he just offers something a, a little bit different. I think he's willing to to take the the risks that that Watkins won't. Like we said about the the shots again with my sensible hat on some of those shots are a little sporadic sometimes I think the numbers are that he's taken 11 out of his 37 shots in the Premier League um, since he's joined um, outside the box that's not necessarily a, a sustainable rate that you want to mm -hmm. to get in the habit of when you're when you're trying to get a high volume or a high quality um, set of goals so but but then as I say com combining that with Watkins you maybe rough them up for an hour or so and then you bring him on I think that it's no coincidence that that you have someone like that within the the squad and the profiles that all come together to to create winning football, which Emery's clearly doing. I think Mark's completely right in, in that sense. I think with Emery, his whole game plan is about subtlety and variation. Emery will broadly keep the same framework for every game, but it'll change certain bits of certain games. And I think, for example, with John Duran, like you saw, it said about the Leicester, Leicester goal, it was from a Luca Dean you know, or a floated cross into the box. When Watkins plays, Villa tr tend to build and choreograph attacks through cutback crosses. You know, Duran gives a little bit more of a variation, more of a direct route. You see his goal against Bayern Munich. They've done that before in terms of Paul Torres whipping that ball through the lines. He did it last year against the Burning. Same run, same finish, or and the same pass from Paul Torres. And Watkins probably wouldn't, wouldn't make that type of run because obviously he's not left-footed. He'd be, probably be more inclined to run in the rights channel. I think there's little subtle variations that you can get with Duran that you necessarily can't get with Watkins and vice versa. Will there be a point though, like any hungry striker? And I know he's only young, so let's 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 get that out there. That this sort of supporting role doesn't suit him, Jacob. You know, you you saw over the summer there were a lot of offers, um, as mm. Aston Villa did point out for John Duran. A lot of people are interested in this striker. How long can he stay as a bench player coming on to make a difference? Yeah, well, it almost feels like he's a bit of a ticking time bomb, really. He believes he is the best striker at Aston Villa, and I would probably say that he probably thinks he's the best striker in the Premier League. That's mm. his confidence levels. Uh, but I think he's quite happy with the role he's doing now. 
but there will be a point where he thinks, you know, why why don't I start a few more games? I think Unai Emery's made it clear in a lot of press conferences recently that he's working on a plan to incorporate both of them together. But the way Villa play, with they they tend to have two number tens between the lines, that would be affected, and the whole you know build up would be affected having you know two number nines up top. Uh, I think there will be a point, maybe a crossroads. I don't know when it will be when Duran wants to play, but there's a feeling that Villa will either sell him for 100 million or he'll replace Ollie Watkins, you know, eventually. It's interesting as well because he, he, he does think that he's the, the best striker, but you can maybe break that down into to different facets, especially because of the type of profile of player that you and I, Emery want. So is he the best striker or is he maybe the best finisher? And then you think of Ollie Watkins as maybe a better presser out of possession. And all of those things are so crucial in the modern game now that Ollie Watkins is fantastic off the ball. He's fantastic at working the channels. And that's why maybe, as I mentioned before, when you're against it's tired defences. John Durant can come in, get all the plaudits and finish fantastically. But it's it's all about all the things around it, not just the, the finishing skill. And to Jacob's point as well, all of the, the knock-on effect that that has tactically in the build-up to you know getting into the final third with the, the midfield and, and the fullbacks coming in, the difference in the crosses that you mentioned. So I think it's one of those that... Uh, I saw something recently with uh, John McGinn. I don't know if you saw it about how Unai Emery was quite scathing in saying you were... I'll say rubbish instead of polite <laughs> way. I think he said it a little bit more fruity than that. But it was very honest and open with his players to say, you need to improve X, Y, Z. And I think it could be one of those that Emery's maybe saying to Duran, if you do really want to start, you need to improve on all of these other facets to make you more of a well-rounded striker rather than just being the one who goes and gets all of the, the plaudits, as I say. So I'm sure that this work going on in the background to, to work on all facets of his game rather than where he clearly thinks he's already got his strengths. And Jacob, do you know, is, is there another facet to this as well before we move on that actually you've got this young lad who's chomping at the bit to make a start for Aston Villa, makes Ollie Watkins a better striker, having to raise his game that little bit more? Because if you know, I'm just thinking about the psychology of football. If you're looking over your shoulder, every time this lad comes on, he keeps scoring. At what point is the gaffer going to start him? I think it depends on the personality, right? I think Watkins is you know, uplift under Emery coincided with when Emery made the decision to sell Danny Ing. And Ollie Watkins have become really the only only striker at the club in you know in January 2023. So maybe Watkins needs that reassurance that he is you know the number nine that you know he will play every game. Or you know it depends on his personality. Maybe he likes that type of competition. I think for him, if you had to ask him, he probably wants a few more minutes. He's getting taken off around the hour mark when the game's you know in the balance. And for a guy like Ollie Watkins who had that incredible summer scoring in the European you know, Championship semi final, rated arguably but high early uh, Arling Hart. Erling Haaland in terms of goal scoring number nines in the Premier League, you know, playing the, you know, more minutes, being in those big consequential moments is probably what he wants. And I think this season he started very slowly. He's got gradually back into it, but I think it all depends on his personality. And like I say, having a character like John Duran behind him um, is, is interesting for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to uh, John Duran and, and who he is, you know, personality wise, because Jacob, you know, all superheroes, or I should say cult heroes at this moment in time have an origin story. And, you know, you've recently written a profile piece on John Duran um, and how he got to where he is at this moment in time. I mean, he's only 20 years old, as I said earlier, you know, young Colombian striker um, started in the MLS. But is it, th there's a feeling that Aston Villa have been monitoring this young lad for quite a while. Yeah, I think John Duran... Everyone knows his physical gifts are is so precocious. And Villa, when they eventually did sign him after a long time of, of trying to, you know, get him to join, really, it was huge source of satisfaction. They tried so hard to get him. Uh, Wes Edens, who's the owner, um, co-owner, he flew out uh, to Chicago when he was at Chicago Fire to, to try and convince him to sign. Villa were back and forth flights uh, to the US, to, uh, multiple presentations to outline the pathway for John Duran. But I think there was a point where they were quite nervous about uh, signing him because they saw Atletico Madrid. They really liked him. There was a lot of other interests from Europe and they thought for a brief moment that he, you know, they'd, they'd miss out. I think f f John Duran's story is, it's not like most, you know, he, he's from mm -hmm. Colombia. He, he came through, you know, on Vergado, uh, you know, in Colombia. He lived in a, you know, a pretty poor poor area and the coaches there had to give him some leeway similar to what Unai Emery's doing now he you know really didn't like school he would be found at home listening to music singing instead of doing his studies and I think that drove the, the, the teachers crazy and maybe you know a similar situation to Villa now in terms of he is pretty unpredictable but when they did sign they knew that if they can get this guy on the track you know on you know 
and ready to to perform. I think they think he's a really special talent that, that could serve them for, for years down the line. Yeah, and um, Mark, you know, it, is it down to John Duran? You know, we talk about Unai, you know, and being a master tactician, I should say. Um, is it down to John Duran personally, though, that he's actually getting these numbers early? Because, you know, th th there's a personality there that obviously wants to be really very good. No, I totally agree. I think we've said it already. He's, he's not short of confidence. Full stop, mm. never mind his age, but he's not short of confidence. And I think it is about having that elite mindset to to come on during a game when it's in full flow and get up to speed pretty quickly and know and be confident that you're going to make an impact. And yes, you might be frustrated that, that he's not starting many, if if any, games, but you've got to channel that and use it in a positive way and, and show your quality and show it with the, the energy that you have. And obviously... Goal scoring certainly helps with that. So I certainly think it's it's him to to a certain extent. I think it is interesting from a, a tactical perspective or a, a planning perspective, the the timing of the substitution as well. I think that, you know, looking at it, I mentioned it already, but he seems to come on between 60 and 70 minutes, almost always in those sorts of minutes. So it, I guess it means two things. One, that he can prepare himself to to know that within, you know, within a, a window of few minutes he knows that he's going to come on so he can prepare himself maybe at the start of the second half to to think okay it's it's getting ready for for my time which helps sort of cognitively psychologically mm. um and it also gives you sufficient time to to make an impact knowing that you've got minimum half an hour in the modern game now the additional time is close to 10 minutes so it might be that he's got 30 maybe 40 minutes to actually make an impact rather than four or five minutes at the end of the game where you're just expected to be the hero with a single shot, a single moment, whatever it may be. So I think that's really interesting as well. And it's a piece that um, my colleague Elias Burt wrote about with, with super subs. And obviously Duran was a key part of mm -hmm. that. And he spoke with uh, Sammy Lander, who's a dedicated substitution coach, talking about all of these things that can at least maximize the chances that substitutions are going to make an impact. So I imagine with, you know, Emery's, meticulous sort of methods he has probably thought about all those things as well and trying to maximize uh, all of his substitutions chances but as you say I think it's also crucial that you've got someone who is and has an elite mentality he, he kind of preys on the opposition's dysfunction as well obviously that there's obviously that co common school of thought that defenses get more tired and it's great for substitutes and you probably saw that in the Bayern Munich goal with Upper McCann who was marking Ollie Watkins so tightly during that game mm. could have arguably been sent off in that game but then you know Emi Martinez got the ball uh, and, and Bayern Munich were back into shape and that allowed Paul Torres to put that ball into the channel and Upper McCarley wasn't there to catch John Duran. I think if you look at all his goals as well, Leicester was at a crucial point, uh, you know, Everton as well, when they were trying to protect a lead. Th these are cru crucial points in games that, that John Duran thrives on and also the fatigue of opposition players does come into into account. I think if you see the games he has started, you know, three Premier League starts last season, the Wickham Cup game this season, he's probably not been at his sharpest. And there is that question mark is whether he is actually a starter because his impact mm. does seem to seem to reduce, especially early on in games. The only other comparison that I can think of in recent years is probably Divock Origi and he had the same sort of thing where he'd come yes, off the bench Liverpool, for Liverpool. Yeah. He mm. was a cult hero. He would score crucial goals and crucial mm. moments. Um, yeah, often in the final 10 minutes of games. And then there were occasions, injury was also played a part, but there were occasions where he would start in maybe lesser games where you thought, okay, he maybe get a couple here because it's against weaker opposition, be it yeah, in the league or in the cup. And he didn't quite look the same. It just didn't quite click for, for the reasons that we all know about. So I don't know if there's maybe an element of that a little bit, that there is something to be said about, I don't know, something you can't almost quantify in the mindset, whatever it is, all of the things kind of conspiring together to make a certain player a substitute mm. player rather than a starting mm -hmm. player. I don't know what that is, but of course, time will tell. It's still very early on in, in terms of his age, as we mentioned, but the minutes that he's played, I think in total, he's only played about a season's worth of league minutes in his career. And of course, because he's so young, that makes sense. But um, yeah, of course, he's going to start more games across the course of his career. And it'll be interesting to compare and contrast of just what his output is. Yeah. Um, Jacob, I just want to touch on a little thing. Um, it, it is that Duran's social media antics are, are how can I put it, quite interested. Um, <laughs> you know, you've seen the the, the, the Irons one he, he, he put out, obviously, because of the interest from West Ham, spoken about, you know, by Munich. Um, 
Is this just him being John Duran? Because for me, this is what I personally like about players, you know, a bit of cheekiness, a bit like Balotelli, you know, you never know what you're going to get, you know, um, but also absolute ballers on the field as well. Exactly. He's just, you know, pure entertainment. I don't think he's a, a press officer's dream, to be honest with you, but he's, <laughs> he, he he struggles with English still. I think that doesn't help. But I was remember after the West Ham game, the first game of the season, I just I was stood in the mix zone, 45 minutes waiting. I, wanted, I really wanted to speak to him. And he came through, big headphones on, singing in this high-pitched voice. And he was just singing to himself in his own world. And I think that just sums him up fantastically, really. He's a, he is, you know, a quiet character. You, Monchi, you know, Damian Vidigan, who's Emery's personal assistant, now director of football, they talk to him a lot. Monchi's got you know kids that are older than John Duran, and I think Emery and those you know those three see him as almost like their son in a way. They always call him into their office to make sure he's okay, to keep reminding him of his of you know how good he is, the the the, the plan, uh, and I think they have to have these talks to him just to make sure that he feels loved and make sure he's still you know on track. But like you say, I think it was pretty embarrassing uh, in the summer really when Villa woke up and they saw John Duran on his Instagram live, 2,000 people watching, you know, doing an iron-shaped gesture. Then, you know, him and his agent will be in Colombia. On, in this, in this, some sort of shop, saying how much they loved West Ham and how they would want to go to Chelsea, and even after the Bayern Munich game, he said he would, would like to play for them one day. He doesn't really learn, but I think that's him. He do, he can't be told. He's unfiltered, and I think, like I said at the start of, of the show, in this modern game where everything's so filled, having a guy like him who plays like he does, talks like he does, mm. and has the skill and the confidence to back it up, it's just he's so enthralling to watch. I wonder what the effect he has on players around him, Jacob. You know, do we get a sense of how he integrates it, it into the Aston Villa team? Because when you've got someone that's a bit of a... It feels like a loner, really. Mm. It must be hard to link up with him. It must be hard to connect with him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I've had co- several conversations with, you know, people in, in the change rooms, with, you know, people close to the change room. And I always ask about John Duran. And some say they've never spoken to him. But, you know, obviously, like I say, he struggles with English. He's uh, mm. a c- 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 kind of aloof at times but also there's times where if you get him in you know a quiet one-on-one he is actually quite funny he's quite quiet he's quite humble uh and he's quite an affable guy to be around i think it de- mm. obviously depends and maybe it's a byproduct of his of his background as well how you know he has to be in certain situations where he feels trusting of someone to really explore his personality but you know john mcginn said in may uh, he's a bit of a he's a bit nuts and he's a bit of a nightmare at times and that <laughs> Perfectly sums it up, really. But at the same time, when you get him away from football, when you get him away from John Duran, the performer, mm. I actually think there's a, a softer, humble side of him. And he's only he's only twenty; he's still a young kid in a new environment. You know, adjusting to the you know the money, the the fame, the adulation. He seems to love it, but at the same time, he's got that softer side to him. You know, I'm slowly putting him in, in the same category as Decanio, Berbatov. I love those players, man. Just a bit naughty, but you know what? So, so good. Uh, Mark, a um, little birdie tells me you've got a, a background in psychology. And by the way, I'm not going to delve into <laughs> John Gerard's profile here. Come on, let, let let man be. But, you know, I'm just thinking about the psychology of the striker, really, um, in terms of selfishness. Do you think, you know, to be a striker, and we've seen Duran with his confidence, you need to have that sort of selfish trait to want to be the best. I think so. It's it's a very interesting question. It's not something that I'd be an expert on in, from a psychology mm. perspective in that regard. I think there's a few things that I think would be interesting from you know looking at the the brain. Uh, I think it is interesting in that regard from a. I, I mean, I don't know about selfish, but you think about strikers and they talk a lot about the the feeling of goal scoring and how it's often like a drug and the the brain element of that is that it's essentially accompanied with a hit of to- dopamine it is mm. essentially what it is it's a hormone that's released in the brain and it's responsible for the reward center it essentially communicates with the the rest of your body and ultimately makes you feel good right and i, I don't have any evidence of this but you'd imagine that strikers are more likely to to make decisions that increase their chances of getting that mm. dopamine hit so that sometimes means shooting from 40 yards against Everton, taking, <laughs> taking risks. You know, you want to think of quick ways that you can you can get that dopamine hit and, and just seeking things in general that make you feel good. So, of course, scoring goals or asking for the number nine shirt and puffing your chest out as a 20-year-old at Aston Villa, it makes sense that those are the sorts of things that maybe relate to um, certain profiles of personalities. And you compare that with someone like a, you know, a defensive midfielder or a centre-back who might be more likely to engage their 
prefrontal cortex. Now, this is, I won't bore everybody too much, but this is an area of the <laughs> I was brain. like, where's it going with this? Come on. <laughs> so the, short, the long and short of it is that it's an area at the front of the brain that essentially regulates our, our thoughts, our actions, our emotions. It's more responsible for those higher order decision making, more thinking and more planning, all the things that you kind of need to have a little bit more um, on the football pitch to, to make rational decisions rather than, as I say, shooting from, from 40 yards. So far less based on, on reward in, in that regard. But you'd think it's a very broad brushstroke that I'm saying here, but you'd think, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if strikers maybe did perform differently than players in other positions on psychological personality tests because of that, that desire, that need for that reward system and that dopamine hit. I don't know how to follow Mark after after that, but <laughs> yeah, be careful is... what you say because uh, <laughs> I want technicals here. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at Joanne's career at Villa so far, it's been full of you know extreme highs, but also a lot of lows. You see it on his Instagram. You know, last season when he wouldn't play games, he delete always Aston Villa social media. He it always felt last season that he you know he invited the controversy when he didn't play away to you know Stamford Bridge in the cup he would tweet out with and like he would like my tweet about John Durant and, and Chelsea and how he would hug Pochettino before games he wanted it almost felt like he wanted to create this chaos he creates chaos on the pitch but he also wanted it off the pitch as well maybe that's just a, a product of him but also it shows that at Villa he's had this seesaw narrative really where if you if you ask Villa fans in the summer I would say the most wanted him gone, really. They thought he was too chaotic, too many issues. Where right now, his stock's really high. They're thinking we can live with this you know, chaos nature. But I think what's great in terms of managing this is that Villa have, have took a really good approach, really. They've indulged his, you know, you could say maverick tendencies in a way, but they've also got to know the guy as well, who's can be, like I say, can be a soft, softly spoken, really humble figure. And they've given him leeway. Emery's not known for his, you know, man management, but he's seen that, Duran, you have to treat him slightly differently. Uh, it's the coach and staff as well, and they've really invited him to be who he is, but also keep him on, on the. There's a fine line between being a problem but being a good problem, and they've managed to keep him on that line. If they can keep him there for longer, that's going to serve him really well. And he's only 20, so you'd like to think the older he gets, the more he matures, and the, those dips are going to be less. Okay. I almost don't want him to mature, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> anyway, uh, it has been an incredible start to the season for Duran. Cap with that historic goal against Bayern Munich in the Champions League, writing himself into Villa fan folklore. But what do the Villa fans make of their newest cult hero? Here's Villa fan and broadcaster Dan Bardell on the man of the moment. John Duran, where do I start? Captain Chaos. Last season... He made an impact in certain games, but when he was coming off the bench last season, he was just as likely to score a world-class goal as he was to elbow someone in the face and get sent off. So it did just feel like chaos every time he entered the fray. Obviously, there was all these issues in the summer around, you know, he wanted to leave, he wanted to go to somewhere where he was going to play, heavy links with West Ham, heavy links with Chelsea. And I've got to be honest, I was quite content for him to go. And when Villa turned down allegedly £35 million from West Ham, I couldn't believe that we turned it down. Thank God that we did. Because this season, you know, his goals already have earned Villa so many points. I think he's moved house in the summer. So I believe he was living in the in the city centre. He's now moved away, has settled down. But he's just been absolutely incredible. You know, the thing that's impressed me the most is the variety of finishes. He's won games coming off the bench against West Ham, scoring the winner against Everton at Villa Park with an absolute thunderbolt and then doing what he did against Bayern. You know, Villa are in a really, really fortunate position now. The fact that they've got Ollie Watkins is one of the best strikers in Europe that's been proven over the last 18 months. And John Duran is probably the hottest young striker playing in Europe right now. So if he keeps his head down, you know, the world really will be his oyster. Uh, uh, Jacob, you know, Ollie Watkins, we've got to talk about this, you know, is one of Europe's best number nines right now. And, you know, Duran is one of Villa's hottest properties, as Dan says. Um from what you've seen, and I'm really fascinated to know if this is actually something that's feasible, can we see both Watkins and Duran playing together and be as effective as Villa have been so far? I think this is the biggest question for Unai Emery. Obviously, we, we all know he works long days and he likes to internalise his emotions and he likes to be really in his head with, you know, tactics and the system and the overall structure. And I think this is the thing that he's working on. I think the plan is perfectly for Duran and Watkins to play up front together but like myself and Mark have said there is an issue because the way Villa play they play a lopsided you know back four with the right back tucking into form a back three the left winger a uh, left back becoming a left winger and they 
try and with the left winger tucking in to become the number 10. So they always try to play two number 10s and that's a key part of how they play. They like to funnel things centrally. They like to punch passes into the number 10s through Pau Torres and the double pivot and connect there. And a lot of Watkins' movement is, is once the number 10 receives the ball and he then runs into the channels and mm-hmm. between a centre-back or full-back. And that's a really important part of, of Villa. But of course, that's going to be you know, a knock-on effect is going to be when Duran plays because in the small sample size we've seen of those two starting together, Watkins tends to be the guy that's that's linking, uh, who tends to be dropped deeper and that kind of impacts his strengths as well because his strengths are running away from the ball, not coming towards mm-hmm. it. So how they play together is something that Emery is, is constantly thinking about but he won't do it unless he is double sure that, you know, it, that it can work. But all- also at the same time, the person that it will probably impact the most is Morgan Rogers, who plays just off Ollie Watkins, and he's been absolutely fantastic this season as well. So, yes, it will come with increased perks if it pays off, but at the same time, there is a lot of risk playing them two up front together. Yeah, that, this is the thing, uh, Mark. You know, just because you've got two great strikers doesn't mean their skill sets will complement each other, but also it means letting go of another player that could be as effective in, in, in making the team tick beautifully. But who knows if this would actually work in a full plan? Yeah, and the only way to, to find out is by playing them. But at the elite mm. level, when you're playing in Champions League games and pushing for Champions League football next season, you know, the mistake of, well, you know, the difference between a win and a draw could be could be huge. So where do you make those mistakes other than on the field? Of course, you can train it, but you just never know really until you're up against an opposition. And I agree with everything that both of you have said. It's, it's never as simple as, you know, putting two attacking players or any number of attacking players and just front loading them and expecting it to be well, expecting it to click and it to result in more goals. And we really saw that only recently with the England performance, didn't we? Of just putting mm-hmm. all of the amazing attacking talent together, it didn't work. And that's why you need to think about at the elite level, as I say, in, in the Premier League, the, the tacticians that look to try and form a game plan specifically to the opposition, there's there's very little margin for error. So there's there's no time to to really work on that. And as you guys said, I think the, the specific players outside of that, Morgan Rogers had an, an excellent season so far and he's far more of a ball carrier and he needs that space to kind of go into. Whereas Duran's a bit more macro in his movements. I don't think he's kind of maybe got that subtlety of being able to to wriggle around and, and dribble past people. And yeah, all the knock on effect that we spoke about before in terms of the, the crossing and, and everything like that and the different types of crossing. And, you know, if I was being facetious, I'd say that I'd argue that they are still working together, just not necessarily on the pitch at the same time. They're mm-hmm. working together like we spoke about before in Watkins making those channel runs, roughing up the, the centre-backs and tiring them out. And then Duran maybe comes and finishes finishes things off. And I think we spoke about substitutions and substitution coaches before. If you see Duran and reframe it as he's the finisher for the final 30, 40 minutes and, and Watkins is the starter, they are still working together and dovetailing but just maybe not always on the pitch at the same time. So as I say, we'll see. I'd be really interested to see how it works because there might be occasions when they do play together that might get in each other's way. They are still strikers. Ultimately, they have the instinct to try and you know, get to the front post or the back post or whatever it is. They'll need to work out those patterns. But uh, yeah, it's exciting. The, the, having the options, I think, for Unai Emery is, is the crucial thing. So it's a very good problem to have. It's a cliche, but it's true. Well, that's what I wanted to end on, really. This being a very good problem to have, Jacob, for Aston Villa. Um, You forget this is a team that was relegated, came back, uh, and it's been a really interesting build. Um, But I guess we're also seeing with ambition where Aston Villa want to go with the recruitment and also having these key players who are very effective when asked, asked of. Yeah, definitely. I think obviously Aston Villa have got Fulham this weekend and it'll be nearly two years to the day since Stephen Gerrard's last game at Craven Cottage and it almost feels like a great market to see the the team that Gerrard had then to the one that's now. And there's a lot, the spine of the team is roughly the same. Emi Martinez, obviously Tyron Minks is back from injury soon, Konza, Kamara, Watkins, but the structure of the team is and Emery always says consistency is the key thing. So whether it's consistency in messaging, consistency in performance, but Villa have got to a point where this summer it might not have been the best. I think there was a few holes in the squad still due to PSR that it can't add. You know, right back is an ongoing issue, but they've got a team and a manager that knows how to get results even when they're not playing well. So there were fears that they could do an almost like a Newcastle where they have a lot of injuries this season and and decline. Where I think Emery has built a structure that can withstand that. They've not been at their best at times this season, but yet they've only lost one game in the Premier League. So I think they're trying to create a structure where they get into the top six, they break that ceiling into the top six, top seven, but they stay there and they've now got depth 
depth, especially in midfield, which is uh, key for them, especially in all the competitions. Yeah, fantastic, gents. This has been a really enjoyable podcast and uh, let's hope to see whether Duran can do it against Fulham in, in Villa's next match. Mark, Jacob, thank you so much for your time. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.